talk is uh, Gemma from CMU. We we'll talk about machine learning for single cell 3D epigenetics. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, uh, it's it's great to to visit here. And um, I'm from um, Carnegie Mellon School of Computer Science, and um, I will uh, give you an introduction of our recent work in developing computational methods for um, 3D genome, in particular for uh, single cell uh, 3D genome. In the past couple of decades, uh, we have seen you know, tremendous progress in computational biology for um, analyzing genome sequence and also functional genomic data. Uh, but the type of data that we have been dealing with, um, as you know, are um, not really capturing the in situ patterns of the biomolecules and also um, cells um, in a way that they're typically, you know, flattened without their spatial context. DNA sequence is a linear string or gene expression is just as a matrix. Uh, so as you know, recently there are a lot of uh, experimental development in high throughput methods to probe the spatial organization of both the chromatin and also the cells, but there are pressing computational uh, challenges. Yesterday, we heard about uh, spatial uh, transcriptomics you know, from, from Shannon and, and, and Martin. And my group, we are also very interested in that and developed um, some, some methods on that. But I won't talk about that today. Today, I will focus on the intracellular organization, in particular, uh, the intranuclear spatial organization. Collectively, I call them spatial biology or spatial uh, genomics, uh, but there's sometimes it may be a little confusing. I was recently invited to give a talk at NASA, and then uh, I know that uh, they're also working on spatial biology, but they're dealing with something that astronomically different in terms of scale and, and also distance. <laughs> so our genome, we have, you know, as we all know, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, um, 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 you know, three, about 3 billion base pair uh, sequence, and they're Actually, if you stitch all the DNA together, it's about six feet long, two meters. Uh, but the cell nucleus is only about five micrometer uh, in size. And so the chromatins are packed and folded into this teeny tiny little uh, cell nucleus. Unfortunately, the principles and regulations of um, this kind of organization um, are actually not quite clear still. In the past um, 10, 15 years or so, because of the development in high throughput whole genome chromatin interaction mapping methods like hi -C, we have learned quite a bit of the, um, um, uh, the 3D genome organization in terms of the features. And we know that um, the 3D organization is not a heterogeneous, it doesn't have a heterogeneous um, uh, pattern and the nucleus is, 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 has various types of organelle and it, has it actually it has multi-scale structures that you can actually observe from uh, high C data, uh, for instance, the, uh, at, the, at the large scale, the, the chromatins are organized into these so-called A and B compartments, which largely correspond to active and inactive chromatin. Um, and if you zoom in, and you, you're going to see more uh, fine scale structures, like chromatins are also organized in these local uh, structure called topologically associated domains, where um, uh, uh, the chromatins are interacting within, uh, more frequently within the domain than the surrounding uh, regions. If you keep zooming in, you're going to see more fine scale structures uh, like these chromatin loops where you see a, a, um, a dot, you know, off diagonal dot with higher intensity, which reflects that those two regions on the chromosomes are spatially much more, much closer to each other than, than the surrounding regions. Of course, you know, these, um, there, there are other types of more complex and fine scale structures that you can discover from the high C data. And these are just the three very distinct levels of, of structures, AB compartment, tasks, and loops, which I will you know, mention this um, several times in the rest of the presentation. And many computational methods have already been developed to analyze these, these data. As you may, may uh, guess, you know, for uh, uh, the data set itself, it depends on the coverage and uh, the, the resolutions that you're looking at. Uh, for fine scale structures or loops, you really need more powerful methods to identify them. So I was always joking, you know, it's some people just eyeballing these, these, these maps, it's really not reliable because it depends on how much coffee or alcohol you have, you're gonna see different kind of uh, patterns from these, from these maps. So you need more reliable methods to do that. Um, 
one some of the um, um, our efforts um, that my lab is working on right now is in the context of an NIH consortium called for the uh, nucleum. There are four major integrative analysis centers in this consortium, and we're in the second year, and we're uh, uh, leading uh, one of the four uh, centers, which is headquarters at Carnegie Mellon. We have nine investigators in different institutions, and uh, our goal is slightly different than the uh, conventional high C based you know, approaches, where we try to map the large scale chromosome structures in terms of their compromisation to major uh, nuclear bodies uh, in the nucleus. Uh, so like nucleoli, nu nucle the largest nuclear body, but there are all, uh, also other subnuclear structures like nuclear speckles, Kaha bodies, PML bodies, and all these. And some of the bodies have yet to be uh, discovered. How the chromatins are interacting with these, these uh, various types of nuclear bodies are, are, are um, we, we have very limited knowledge. So our, our center of projects is to try to develop both the genomic mapping, imaging-based approach, together with, let's say, physics-based structure modeling, together with machine learning-based integration methods to have a more holistic view of the cell nucleus. Um, uh, for example, last year, we uh, developed a very, actually a very uh, straightforward approach based upon Marco Random Field by integrating high C data with the genomic mapping where the uh, genomic signals reflect the distance or contact frequency between the chromatin and the particular nuclear body. So the hidden states here are the uh, 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 spatial position in the nucleus relative to multiple nuclear bodies, and the observations are the signals from the from these the genomic map, mapping, in, in particular the DEMID and also the TSA seq uh, 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 signals. I won't get into the details in these assays, assays, but if you have interest, you can uh, take a look at the at, at the at the paper. So ultimately, uh, you basically try to partition the genomes into these color bars, where each color bar represents a distinct position in the nucleus relative to multiple nuclear bodies. And these information drastically enhances the uh, A and B compartmentalization I mentioned to you uh, on the previous slide and provides further stratification of various types of genomic and functional genomic data. Very importantly, it's um, uh, key to connect the structural features with functional properties uh, within the nucleus. And uh, we, um, um, the, 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 the analysis of the interaction of, with nuclear bodies highlights the importance of, of, of having a more, more integrative lens to look at these things in, in the nucleus. Um, so in, in this paper uh, we, we did uh, uh, about two years ago, what we did is to integrate the uh, uh, 3D chromatin interaction with transcriptional regulatory network. So in a way that you can um, uh, start to um, see that uh, these, uh, these, these chromatins are, are coming together and uh, at the same time, the genes on these chromatins are being regulated by the same set of transcription factors and forming these very interesting um, hubs or some people, or some, some, sometimes people call them uh, nuclear condensates in, in, the, um, in, the, in, in the nucleus where they have particular functions and, and also structural uh, properties. In this work, we um, actually developed a graph mining uh, approach to identify these modules and it's in principle, it is a graph partitioning approach, but the difference here is rather than looking at, uh, try to minimize the you know, number of times you're uh, going uh, through the edges, you're actually trying to minimize the number of times you're cutting across a graph motif. So this is built upon early work from uh, Yuri Lostkovich's lab at Stanford. So these results are um, um, interesting and they're providing new perspectives of the nuclear structure by looking at the data in different ways. Um, but unfortunately, there, there, you know, all these uh, work so far, most of the work so far are based on bulk assays, like bulk high C or bulk um, epigenomic assays. They're not, they're not reflecting what's going on in single cell. And that's what I wanted to introduce to you uh, today, uh, mostly. Uh, so uh, first, you know, there are very recently, there are single cell three genome mapping is an emerging direction in epigenomic research. And there have been quite a bit, quite a lot of, uh, if you, you know, uh, single cell, three genome single cell high C data um, have been published in the past um, uh, few years. And in, in, in general, they, they, you know, there's some certain differences in, in terms of the experimental details, like how you actually incorporate the, um, uh, uh, you know, for different cells, how you in incorporate their uh, cell, 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 single cell specific indices, right? You can incorporate in different ways, whether it's part of the, um, um, only in the sequencing primers, or you also try to incorporate into 
uh, uh, the ligation adapters, uh, for instance, the Jay Shandura and Zhe Jin Duan's method, I think they try to incorporate both, uh, but some of the other uh, uh, single cell high C approaches are, are, are handling this different, uh, like uh, Sunny Shia's DIPC, they're uh, doing this during the amplification uh, uh, step. But regardless of the experimental technologies, uh, the computational challenges are monumental. It's, it's, it's much more uh, uh, um, um, uh, challenging than the single cell RNA seq or single cell ATAXI. As you can see from uh, these kind of uh, maps, this is a bulk high C contact maps that you have seen before, but these are single cell high C contact maps. They are extremely sparse and uh, because you know, it's, it's, it's two dimensional, you can only capture certain interactions and uh, the, the number of reads that supporting each interaction is, is small. And um, there's also a lot of dependencies among these um, different entries and, and their, their noise. But they're, they're, uh, so far there, there have been some um, single cell high, high C analysis methods and they typically follow these two frameworks. First is you want to generate embeddings for each cell, right? For each cell you have an embedding, you can do subsequent analysis, clustering and, and so forth. Second, um, um, we typically also are interested in the three genome features like I introduced to you in the beginning, like AB compartments or um, TADs at single cell level, right? If it's very, very sparse, then there's no way to identify them. So one way to do that, to mitigate that is to, let's do some imputation. You try to guess to impute the missing values and then fill the entries, fill the empty entries in this contact map such that you'll be able to more reliably call Pads, you know, compartments, and even loops in single cells. So here's our uh, uh, solution, and this is mostly done by a graduating PhD student, Ruo Chi. Um, uh, so what we uh, we, we had a, a so first of all, our approach is let, let me just, because of time limit, I just directly go into the solution. So we use this hypergraph formulation as a solution to model high order chromatin interactions. So we all know graphs, so you have nodes and edges. Um, hypergraph, you also have nodes and edges. Nodes are, you know, nodes, and then they can have different attributes. Um, but edges, um, you may, uh, it doesn't have to be pairwise interactions. You can have multiple nodes to form these uh, hyper edges. So if the hypergraph, all the hyper edges have the same uh, number of nodes and it's uniform, right? You can call it a K uniform hypergraph, but if it, it you know, it doesn't have to be, you can have a, a more, uh, 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 a non-uniform heterogeneous uh, hypergraph as well. So hypergraph, you can, you know, for instance, there is an example co-authorship. So each node is an um, individual, a researcher, let's say, uh, but they have, they may have different roles, right? So co-authors or corresponding authors, and then each um, orange circle here represents co-authorship. And then that each uh, orange uh, circle is the hyper edge. Uh, so for, for example, you can also model events, human location activity, as in hyper edge, in hyper, um, and then you can you can uh, represent uh, both the hyper edge and also the nodes in the hypergraph, um, in in you know in 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 a, in a lower dimensional space. Um, so the task is here is that for a given hypergraph with features on each node, we uh, want to learn the embeddings of the node in the hypergraph, um, and then you can also learn to predict whether um, an hyper edge exists. For example, if I give you some individual in, in the context of social network, if you know some individual's online activity, right? What have what type of posts they that this individual has uh, liked? You want to predict, you know, if I give you three or four individuals, whether these four three individuals are going to form a group chat, for instance. So this this analogy here is exactly what we're trying to achieve: is using their um, um, the the attributes of the node and together with their pairwise interactions we may be able to predict their high order properties, high order interactions. Um, so the, the, uh, we had a solution, what we call hypersegon, and it was uh, actually published in the machine learning conference uh, uh, earlier. And then the student uh, wrote, you know, we came up with, a, with an idea that you can actually use this to model uh, single cell high C data. So the key um, um, results or, or the key idea is really on this part of the uh, slide, you model each, uh, so these are single cell, single cell high C contact maps, right? Each map is a sparse contact map where if there is an entry there, it means that there's a read from the single cell high C data supporting that interaction. Now, for each entry in this 
contact map, we, act, we can use a hyper edge to represent that. And where each hyper edge, all the hyper edges will have three nodes, where one node is the cell node and the other two are the genomic bin node. So one hyper edge here represents the fact that two genomic bins are interacting with each other in a particular cell. So in a way that all the, or if you ha you're given a single cell high C data set, you can use one hypergraph to represent the entire data set, right? Where you have cell nodes, you know, you have 1000 cells and you have 1000 cell nodes and the genomic bins are, you know, depending on your resolutions, you'll be able to have these genomic bin nodes. And the hyper edges are really referring to the fact that these two genomic bins are interacting with each other in a given, in, in a given cell. Uh, so you can certainly generate embeddings of the node, of the cell node, and then you can do clustering. Let's say you can use the, the patterns of the single cell high C to uh, study you know, how these cells are, are or the subtypes of the cells from a complex tissue, as I will show you in a minute. Or you can um, also do imputation, where the imputation becomes equivalent to uh, um, um, predicting the existence of the hyper edge, right? Is it's a missing entry, and you try to predict what is the probability that these two genomic beings are interacting with each other in a given cell. So with these these two, basically, uh, we um, uh, turn that uh, these two problems I mentioned to you on the previous slide into embeddings of the cell and the imputation of the of the contact map. Uh, this was actually published recently. Now showing some results um, how this uh, how there are some earlier methods for uh, embedding. And uh, we show that we can, you know, um, overall you can do you can you can do better. Uh, the what we call our method is Higashi can do better. One of the features of, of our approach that you can uh, incorporate additional attributes on the node, right? In a hypergraph, each node you can have additional attributes. And there's one data set where uh, this uh, uh, um, uh, data set is the uh, Lee et al. This is actually co-assay data between single cell high C and the methylation. If for each node, you also have their methylation information uh, as attribute, uh, you can uh, do even better in terms of the uh, uh, separation of the complex uh, cell type. I'll show you um, one more uh, result on this, like how uh, the, the type of advances, advances that Higashi is introducing to this type of analysis in terms of separating uh, 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 cell types in, in, in complex tissues. Now that's embedding, but how about the imputation? And the imputation is, is, is uh, um, uh, tricky because we don't know ground truth, right? Uh, you know, you can do simulation, but how do you know the, 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 um, uh, the contact map you're simulating are uh, realistic? So one approach we uh, took here is to use the um, imaging data. So there's recent uh, development in imaging the 3D genome uh, using, you know, uh, single molecule uh, uh, based approaches. And then this is being to at all uh, 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 paper from uh, Xiaowei Zhuang's lab. Uh, they did um, these 3D genome imaging for, 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 for the chromosome. So we use this as the ground truth so that you can look at the distances from the imaging. You convert that into a contact map like this, right? So you can con consider this as a ground truth and then you downsample that into a, a very sparse contact matrix. So of course the computational goal right now as evaluation is you run different approaches and see how much uh, you can recapitulate the original patterns. And as we have shown here, Higashi you know, um, can, 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 can do better than the, uh, another method called uh, sing, uh, SC, uh, high cluster, which was developed in Joe Ecker's lab a few years ago, um, both uh, visually and also using uh, uh, quantitative metrics. Um, I forgot to mention, mention one thing is um, in Higashi, we can, in the embedding space, we can also borrow information from each other among the cells in the embedding space. If the cells are close to each other in the embedding space, you can try to borrow information between them. So um, one uh, evaluation here is that if you borrow information from neighboring cells, let's say four neighboring cells, you can achieve even better imputation, right, as, as expected. Uh, so as a, as a confirmation that you look at the neighboring cells in the embedding space, you saw that their patterns are very similar to each other, but if you look at the uh, cells that are very far, far away from, 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 from the cell that you're dealing with in the embedding space, their uh, contact path patterns are very different. Um, and um, so here's um, 
um, some additional results to show you. So this is the original contact map. This is the imputed uh, results. And the imputation allows you to have more reliable analysis of the three genome features like TAD boundaries in individual cells. So the figure on the right hand side, uh, we show you the insulation scores, which, which uh, measures the strength of the boundary of, of, of the domain. Uh, so uh, the uh, lower the score, the stronger the boundary is. So as you can see, without the imputation, then it's very noisy in terms of the insulation scores. But after the imputation, you can more reliably call the um, insulation scores that manifest the TAD boundaries. And uh, from this example, we, sh we show that there looks like there are you know, different types of variability of the TAD boundary in, in, in individual cells. And the region uh, highlighted by the yellow box, it looks like there's a absence and presence of the, of the, of the um, uh, domain boundary where the region uh, highlighted by the uh, red box, it looks like the boundary is shifting on the genome uh, uh, gradually, so these, these could be the different types of variability in terms of these um, uh, domain boundaries in individual cell. One is more, more uh, uh, absent and present, the other is more, uh, the changes are more, more gradual. So this is uh, what I mentioned to you, the application to a complex tissue in the human uh, prefrontal cortex. And um, in the, um, 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 you know, this is one of the most complicated complicated single cell high C data set so far. And in the original publication, the authors uh, stated that if you only use single cell high C part of their data, you will not be able to distinguish the subtypes of accessor neurons and inhibitor neurons. And revi we revisited this, this, this statement and we found that if you use Higashi embeddings, actually you can uh, separate the, uh, I think this is the uh, accessory neurons subtypes, and then this is the inhibitory neurons, and you can separate them into uh, finer scale uh, uh, structures. And if you use the AB compartment scores and also the uh, uh, domain insulation scores that we um, calculated from uh, the uh, individual contact maps, you are also able to separate uh, these, these uh, 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 cell types. And uh, based on the imputation of Higashi, we also calculate the uh, TAT boundaries for each uh, single cell, and we are able to um, identify cell type specific uh, bound uh, the cell type specific features. And the heat map here shows the um, average, you know, single cell AB compartment values, or the um, single cell, uh, you know, average single cell uh, insulation scores of the regions surrounding um, the surrounding the marker genes. So each row is, um, um, you know, here these are the marker genes from. Uh, astrocytes. And so, for instance, this is the marker genes from neurons. As you can tell that the marker genes from these particular cell types, they have higher uh, AB compartmentalization scores from, from the Higashi imputed uh, uh, results. And then uh, if you look more uh, closely, um, we can even uh, distinguish the uh, uh, detailed uh, uh, accessory neuron and inhibitory neuron subtypes based upon uh, these um, uh, single cell level three genome features calculated from Higashi. So um, the method also has uh, some um, quite major limitations, which is also a problem for um, almost you know, other existing single cell analysis methods. First, um, some of the rare cell type identification remains challenging. And so the embedding um, uh, itself could be improved. Second is because this is more a uh, deep learning based uh, uh, approach interpretability uh, remains um, um, a roadblock and it lacks um, in, in interpretability. And we know that the embedding is kind of good, right? It can separate the cell types, but uh, we don't know why it, is, why it is good. So it would be great if there's some alternative approach that can provide um, additional perspective to that. Finally, um, you know, as I listed on the right hand side, uh, there, I think it was mentioned by uh, Shane also yesterday for this uh, spatial transcript tone. There's a trend that these are these data sets are getting increasingly large, right? Originally, in the earlier publications, um, the only you know the authors they only published a few cells of this three genome uh, uh, structures, but these days, you know, each publication will have tens of thousands, thousands uh, at least thousands of cells, and and it, it is it is getting uh, increasingly large in terms of the cell cell numbers. So scale, the method has to be more scalable uh, for that. And here's our um, 
uh, recent effort, and we developed a method called fa Fast Higashi. I, I won't get into the uh, uh, details, and it's actually on Bar Archive, and I hope it will uh, be published soon in, in the journal. Uh, so we, we took a different approach. So we view the single cell contact maps as a multi-way, as, as, sorry, as a multi three-way tensor. Here, you know, um, so you have this, um, uh, let's say, uh, three-way tensor. So the contact maps, right? Contact map itself is two dimension, and then it's across different, different, different cells. And um, this is really motivated by the app applications of matrix decomposition for 1D single cell assays. And we, we, oh, we, we uh, developed this method based on tensor uh, decomposition. So for each chromosome, let's say this chromosome one across different cells, it's gonna be um, decomposed into uh, two, two factors, right? One is the cell embedding, and the other is what we call chromosome specific meta interactions. So meta interaction is analogous to meta genes for its uh, single cell uh, RNA seq. So what you can see here is that for so R is the parameter that you can you can tune in terms of how many you know clusters or groups that you you expect to see, and for uh, cell, cell cell embeddings and then they will reflect different cell types in from 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 the given data set, or and also the chromosome specific matter interactions are gonna capture some um, collective patterns from uh, each, each contact map. And then you can look into that contact map to interpret why, you know, what kind of features are giving rise to a particular uh, cell type or what kind of features are important for determining a particular cell type. And then you can follow that with subsequent analysis to you know, for each cell type, you can then integrate with other assays like single cell attack or single cell RNA seq to connect structure and function. So this is actually what we are uh, currently also working on to see if you can um, uh, elaborate and then further develop this approach by combining fast Higashi with Higashi that I mentioned to you before. You can sometimes, perhaps you can use, use fast Higashi as an initiation for the Higashi because Higashi itself is slow, but the imputation itself, we think it's more advanced than uh, the, 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 um, uh, the component that we implement in, in fast Aigashi. So again, um, if I have interest, uh, please check out the uh, bar archive uh, now. So in the last few minutes, um, I would like to introduce you um, um, a software tool that we developed. So it is um, becoming very important for the 4D nuclear or 3D epigenomics field to um, present all these data in different modalities to the user, right? For hypothesis generation, integrative analysis. And you not only have bulk level assays, you have single cell genomic data, you also have imaging data oftentimes. How do you navigate these information in more unified interface? It's, it, it's not possible yet. And um, like you, you have you know, tools like UCSC Genome Browser for looking genomic tracks. You have high glass uh, to look at uh, high C data. You have, you know, Amaro, Amaro to look at microscopy imaging data, but these tools have not been connected to each other, which is what we try to achieve, really, the integrated visualization. And this is also being done in the context of for the nucleum. So our solution, what we call a nucleum Bowser, and then uh, the paper itself will, will come out in Nature Methods very soon. Um, what we did here is to uh, really achieve what I mentioned to you before. We want to present a unified interface to the user where you don't have to go to different tools. You can just use this one interface and you can arrange these, inter in these, these modules in any way you want. You can look at 3D genome structures, you can look at you know, genomic tracks, you can look at the microscopy images. I'll show you some uh, demos. So like you know, on the left-hand side, this is genomic browser, right? So different genomic tracks, and then you have these high C contact maps. And the, the probes will correspond to the microscopy images that experiments that have been done. And you may also load the um, um, you know, structure models right, from various types of approaches. You can look at, uh, uh, you can load external tools like high glass, which is more powerful to look at these contact maps in a more scalable way. And like UCSC Genome Browser has already hosted vast amount of uh, data sets, encode, epigenome roadmap, it doesn't make sense for us to reinvent the world to store that information. So we just connect them. And these kind of operations are, are uh, mutual. So if you do something on, you know, operate or highlight something on the UCS Genome Browser, our system will also respond. 
And one important uh, implementation that we did recently is to connect with uh, Jupyter Notebook so that you can, you can really significantly enhance the productivity of integrative analysis. You can just look at the, the, the tracks and generate these plots as you move along the, um, the, um, the, the, the Juno browser. So it is often incredibly uh, useful to look at your data in different perspectives. So here I'm showing you that you can drag a big wood track where you have these continuous um, values rather than looking at them in the, in the, in the one dimensional track, like in conventional genome browsers, you can put them in the context of a structure where you can look at you know, their interactions with other nuclear bodies or their, 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 their positions in the nucleus. Or you can compare these structures in different cellular conditions. Here, we're comparing two different cell types, uh, H1 and also K5S2. And you can you know, highlight the region one cell type, and then the other cell type will, will, will respond. And we also implemented a scatter plot like this. You, know, you can select data points on the scatter plot, and then the genomic track is going to show you where these data points are. And you can also use this for a single cell 3D genome analysis, which we have uh, already uh, implemented. This is on the, also the connection between the, the uh, genome browser and, and also the Jupyter notebook. So um, one thing I want to highlight is, um, so this is a unique feature where you can actually connect the micros microscopy imaging data stored in a resource called IDR, um, uh, developed by my uh, our colleague, uh, Jason Swetlow in University of Dundee, which is widely used in, 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 in the imaging uh, community. And we um, integrate them with the genomic tracks. And so here we're using a data set uh, from, uh, uh, from Fei, Fei, Fei Chen's uh, lab uh, published last year in, in science, where uh, this is a whole genome imaging data set. And the, they're already, they already deposited imaging data in IDR. So we didn't grab those files to our local server. We just remotely connect to them so that you can see that these, all these operations are synchronized where you can highlight the regions in the genome browser or a probe in the imaging data where, the, where their locations in the genome browser will be highlighted as well. And then you can certainly click the details of the, of the, of the uh, uh, probes and then look at their, their uh, particular uh, metadata. Um, I actually have uh, this slide, like what is the outlook for unsolved problems? So I think due to the limit of time, I'm gonna skip this. So, um, uh, so I uh, mentioned all these uh, folks' name uh, uh, during uh, the course of my presentation, and then uh, none of this would be possible without the collaboration of many colleagues in the for the nucleum uh, consortium, and also uh, funding uh, sources. Thank you very much. Oh, it's great work. Uh, looks like the community has uh, sort of given up on the interchromosomal uh, data, which would be even sparser than what you Is it the case or? Um... Yeah, so for fault level, uh, there is, there is, you know, you can so, use, you, you can see signals from interchromosomal contact map. It's actually uh, work on that, try to identify patterns from interchromosomal complex, sort of these trends, the trends uh, interactions between different chromosomes. But so right now for single cell high speed uh, is uh, not quite feasible because of the sparseness of the data. You, you're not going to see anything from the uh, uh, interchromosome contact. So can you make use of uh, recent imaging data, for example, from open cell, so live cell imaging of GFP fusion proteins and Computationally, people can distinguish different subcompartments in the nucleus and seeing if those can map to structures that you see with IC and other kinds of methods. Yeah, if there's like so the way that we connect them, right? Yeah. There's there's some you need some information to connect them. So the information that we use to connect them is the coordinates, the genomic coordinates. Right. So if there is, you know, this this kind of metadata available, then it is. It is doable because you can just store the information in Jason Swallow's repository and you'll be able to, we'll be able to connect them and you can see the, you know, the corresponding genomic tracks in this platform. Yeah, it just might link some sort of protein complex machines that are responsible for that right. organization to uh, the data, to right. the organization data. Be cool.